someone does something even in a small way different, you're like, oh, hey, this one, get this one right here. Oh, I will cut two bits. I will cut three bits. <laughs> James Monson didn't do that. Wait, who didn't? Jinx. No, no, Jinx's, you, I wish you could see Jinx's audition reel. It was fantastic. Trixie's fantastic. Katya had a fantastic audition reel. It was amazing. It was amazing. Alaska had eight great auditions. Eight. <laughs> yes. And I like when you do that. I think I like when you tell the, the ones that, that have the other. Uh, Tried and tried, and they make it on the show. And, you know, you go along with that. You know? Also, sometimes it's just you, you talk about people being authentic because there are some people who aren't as polished, aren't great queens, but we all just love watching their tape and we love getting, like, you know, Chi Chi Devena, right? Like, right? We fell in love with her and she was not polished. And she auditioned a few times, and each time we're like, oh, but we all love watching her. And she is a fierce queen. Um, but, you know, sometimes the drag is important, but not as important as who the person is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's also fair to say when the, the queen grew up on the show, like yeah. they, they grow through the course of being 14 episodes. Mm -hmm. And what I love is we do some of those finale parties and they've seen themselves on television now for 14 episodes and they show up and they have changed. Yes. Like they yes. come to play, the dress is made by someone, and it's like out yeah. to here. Everything's cinched, always cinched. Everything cinch. is yeah. perfectly yeah. Yeah. And you know, a few years ago, we did incorporate the um, the look queens in it. Before, you know, we'd always gone for showgirls who had who had business who had. Uh, experience doing shows night after night because that's when you give them a challenge they can work it out but we started incorporating look queens from social media and Violet Chotsky in the Spain you know they didn't have as much nightclub experience so we had to incorporate that because they were fierce in this other way you know and you is it is it a week between each taping it's about an hour. Um, yeah. It's it's it, two days. It's, it's two, two days. days. Two days. That's part of the formula. Episode, probably two to, and sometimes three sometimes days. Because you don't really talk about this. We know in Motown they say that the Motown sounds because the basement of the house where they recorded had special like acoustics. You know, right. drag races about sleep deprivation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like every two days, nothing show. Two days, nothing show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in, the, in Insider Secret, the, the room was actually in Burbank. I mean, the, the, the first, first stage first, yeah. was in Burbank. The car wash, which was our first challenge, was across the street in an empty parking lot. Um, I couldn't tell. <laughs> the control room was like in a closet. It was. Right? We couldn't talk or laugh because it would show up on because the camera. We could not laugh because the queens could hear us on stage if we were responding to something funny they said. Um, we, we had to like walk out of doors and inside to see people. I mean, it was. It was Passive walk. Through the writers, where like the producers were, we have to hide things like they wouldn't know what the yeah. challenge was. And every time BB would always say, Good morning, gentlemen. Where are we? We're with Mike. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Joel. I'm from Australia. Uh, Australia? Australia. <laughs> oh, good on you, mate. Thank you. Uh, where the hell are you from? <laughs> I'm from a town called Adelaide, South Australia. Oh, Adelaide? Yeah. Oh, good on you. Uh, <laughs> So, Drag, uh, Drag Race Thailand has, I think, just launched, and I wanted to know if you guys had any part in that, and if there were other international syndications of the show in, in, in the world. just came back. Well, yes, I, just last week I was in Bangkok, uh, and they were starting to film it. And so, it's basically, the format is licensed to them. It's a production company called Cantona, and they are, the, it's a family business, and the kid who kind of runs the company just loves drag race. And he wears a lace front wig, and he has beautiful makeup every day. He doesn't identify as a drag queen, but he is just, this is a passion for him. And they're using their studios, and they're really going all out. And they are actually sticking to the format. They're doing the whole format. And I gotta tell you, the queens are, I guess it's no surprise, they're amazing. I mean, it's the perfect place, really, to do another iteration of Drag Race. There's also one in Chile. Um, it bears very little relation to the show. We've seen the tape, we can't figure out what's going on. Was it a Chilean one? It's got a different, it's called The Switch. The Switch. Yeah. And then it's like RuPaul's Drag Race Chile. Right, right, right. But, 
Um, I'll send you a link and you, you can and tell us. Do they have like a, the, the, the figurehead, like, like Rupala is? Do they have that? Or is it in, in, in Thailand, they have two hosts. Okay. Because they knew they could never, it was like the question was, who's going to be a Rupal? Who's going to, and they knew they couldn't, that was a, a what's a, a doomed mission uh -huh. to find a, a Rupal. So he said, let's have two hosts. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you've been asked this before, but that's the right question. You don't have to answer it. If you were coming on now to do Snatch Game, who would you do? Oh, Latoya Jackson. Oh. Oh, yeah. Woo! And there's no question. Yeah, yeah I did it, Champagne! <laughs> but that's, you know, we, you mentioned uh, the kids coming on and not knowing, knowing how to do Snatch Game. Snatch Game is the hardest thing to describe to somebody. If you don't know how to play it, you, you, can't, it, you can't describe it because you, unless. I don't know. We've tried and tried and tried. In fact, part of the audition thing, we give them a list of things that they have to include in their audition uh, reel, and a Snatch Game character is one of the things that they have to include. So we have to see a little bit of it. But, uh, you know, it's just either you get it or you don't get it, honestly. And some of the kids, I think all they watch for TV is Drag Race, so all they do are other Drag Race, but they, they don't even know other celebrities to do, because we're just old and we know old. We yeah, know. actually, for the new season, we in, the, in our casting, we've had to ask them not to do other drag queens. How many bias to do? Can you have on the panel? Some of them, they have a little gazing at that point. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, we're just spinning down our little circle. All right, who we got out here? Over here. There we go. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Eliza from the Bronx. Eliza from the Bronx. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually have two questions from two young queens in New York that texted me. Um, they want to know what words of wisdom you would have for uh, queens on first paid gigs, like the first year of their paid gigs. Get the money up front. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the other was, how do you, what helps maximize longevity in the world of drag? Like, how do queens continue to work? You know, I, the reason I'm still here today is um, I, I have to love what I do. And the biggest challenge, not only in drag, but in any profession, is to stay interested in it. Because, you know, because we are freaks or sweet, sensitive souls, it's very easy to get disillusioned by what's going on around here. So you have to have a, you have to have a strong conviction of uh, to beauty and to love and colors. And it can't be about, oh, I want to be famous or I want to be rich. It has to be about what moves you, what gets you out of bed in the morning. And that's not just true of drag queens. That's for everybody on this planet. Everybody acts like they have the rule book in life. That, you know, everybody's walking, I'm, I'm doing it right. I, I button my shirt and I park my car in the designated area. Everybody looks like they're doing it right. Everybody is faking it. Every single person alive is faking it. So you might as well just give yourself a break and have some fun. Give yourself a break, be kind to yourself, and have some fun. That's it. Uh, hi, my name is Joe. I actually live here in Park City. Well, uh, you're from Park City. Where do the people who live in Park City live? <laughs> <laughs> Where do they live? Uh, well, the 4,000 real estates, the 9,000 people that live here actually live in town. Here in town? Yes. Oh. Half the population is real estate. In real estate? Right. Um, and then most people live in Heber. I live kind of halfway between here and Salt Lake. Okay. All right. And what do you do in town? In real estate? Uh, no, I'm in event planning. Um, oh, event planning. Yep. Oh. You work for us? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My question is kind of a two-part question. Uh, at the beginning of the film, it talks about you saying drag is never going to be mainstream, and then yeah. goes through kind of the process of cultural appropriation into drag race becoming this mainstream thing. And do you still feel that's the case? Do you feel like drag race is a bubble that's going to pop and kind of come back into its own world? Have you reached it? And then if not, what can we do as a community or the drag community do to kind of reclaim the culture as its own? and not have it sold off to shows like Lips and Power. Right, you know, I, I don't, that's, a, that's great, that's great, but I don't mind, you know, people talk about cultural appropriation. I, I, I would hate for somebody to tell me, you can't use the color orange, I'm, orange is my favorite color. I would hate for somebody to say, uh-uh, honey, orange belongs to us. 
and <laughs> you are not. I'm like, well, I love all the colors. So, you know, and the thing about the threat, the lipstick battle, it's like, Tommy, we are gay. We have many civil ideas. <laughs> we have so many ideas. You want to take? You can't do it better than us. I know that. <laughs> But, um, I, you know, the, the thing that, the mainstream part of this question, and yes, I did hear, hear all five of your questions, and I will answer all five of your questions. Um, no shame, no shame. The, um, uh, the thing about the mainstream, I mean, years ago when Will and Grace was on television, all the interviewers would say, oh, well, it's a different day now. Will and Grace, I'm like, Child, you live. You must live in L.A. or New York because in the rest of the world, it is still what we thought it was. And drag at its core is about breaking down the ego. We live in an egocentric culture. We elected the the poster child for ego. We are, everybody's about you know in L.A. right now, people don't stop at stop signs anymore. I don't know if they do that here. They just come barreling around the corner like, oh no, bitch, I'm I'm on the list, honey. I don't need to. I don't need to stop with stop signs anymore. Uh, and, um, look, and, like, and look where I'm going. Look where I'm going. No, I don't even need to look where I'm going. I'm just here. It's this, and the ego believes that it can do things that other people can't. It is on its own. And so, um, drag is the antithesis of that. Drag says, Bitch, you are just like everybody else, and you know what? Your identity is, um, it, it, it's interchangeable. It's, it's not that important. So to mainstream drag would mean that people would have to deconstruct their whole belief system. Everything they've been brought up to be is me, 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 me. You have to, you have to be able to, this is where it gets metaphysical, be willing to die and become reborn again. Because every time you put on a different wig or a different guise, you are being reborn. And that's what most people can't wrap their head around because they think, no, what it says I am on my driver's life, that's who I am. I'm a biochemical engineer. Is that a thing? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, and, and I'm a Christian, and I voted for whoever. And it's like, bitch, you are everything. You are everything and nothing at all. And that's that, when people accept that, that is when drag will be mainstream. Because that's what drag is. We're going to go over there. But Charlie, Charlie Sexto, I just wanted my senior partners. Did you have a question? That I'm ignoring you? No? You're okay. But thank you. I just wanted to. I just wanted to add something because the first time Randy and I ever saw Rue, Randy and I were in Atlanta and we were performing in this band and we were driving around the streets and there was this guy putting up wheat posts of himself and he was wearing these wait. I mean, it was not the supermodel look. It was kind of scary, but it was incredible. And the poster said, "RuPaul is everything." And I don't know what it was, but it was in that moment. A, that Randy and I realized we were never going to be pop stars. We better give up on that. But B, that this person, who was Rue, really was onto something. And that idea that each of us is everything is, it's pretty good. And it just was a light, it was a light changing moment, I think, for us. And here we go. And yet, most people can't wrap their brains around it because it would mean the death of the ego to then be able to move to that next level. It's a scary, scary proposition. It was also the first tweet. RuPaul is everything. Yes, this is the first tweet ever. Me and Betsy Ross. I tweeted it to Betsy Ross. <laughs> Can we just talk for a second about those photos of you two at the beginning of your career? It was so cute. I know. That was pretty cute. I like that part. All right, Becca. Hello. Uh, I'm Vivian. I'm from Hi, Los Vivian. Angeles. Los Angeles. I've heard of that. Yeah. Are you in show business? Uh, yes, I'm a comedian, actually. How about that? And Say some something funny. <laughs> <laughs> Do some drag. Okay, I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, I love you so much. I've been watching since season two. I am a big fan, and uh, I just want to say you get me through some dark places. Huh. But speaking of, I, I know the show's blown up, especially on social media, and I was wondering what the show is doing about bullying online because I get that shit, you know? And uh, Fifi got that, I mean, she's a bitch, but like, whatever. But you know, <laughs> she didn't deserve, like, all those mean things. So does the show ever, like, intervene 
you know? Or do you guys ever get involved with that kind of stuff? You just sort of let it go. We we talk to I mean we talk to all the queens before, during, after. We we really try you know because they they sort of enter this world and become celebrities, you know. At, There's some lessons. Yeah, so we, we do the best we can, I mean, uh, and we try and support and guide them and throughout, especially, you know, when there are moments where we think uh, a particular queen might, um, you, you know, an episode might be challenging for a queen or she's gonna get picked on. We try and offer a lot of support leading up to that, after that. Um, you know, the whole, the production, you know, um, and the, the cast together, I mean, I, I still think some of the girls, right when they come off, come, you know, after the first episode, they still have to find their feet. But I think as the show has grown, there's like a community, the other queens, they all offer support. So they all defend one another. Um, and, it, you know, except for the we occasional do, fights. But. Yeah, but we do prepare them. In fact, this last was, I don't know, last season, I don't know what, we did a whole print video, you know, that says, okay, this is what you should be prepared for when you are thrust into this world of being super famous overnight. But, you know, I tell them all the time, I say, look, if, if you had x-ray eyes and you could actually see who wrote that tweet, mm -hmm. you would see a picture of an 11-year-old with a really strong Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> and and, and, and the, they are trying, to, that 11-year-old wants to be part of the conversation. They're using the vernacular. They don't understand the weight of it. They actually don't even mean it maliciously. They're actually, they want to be a part of it. Um, and so you as an artist, and we've been in business for many years, you have to be able to sit yourself down and say, okay, Ego, do you want to co-opt this situation? Do you want to get involved in this? Because the truth is, it has nothing to do with you. And that's the conversation we have with them. You know, well, a lot of people can't hear that because they want to, they want to engage. Like, uh, they don't want to get into it. It's like, no, don't focus on that. Focus on what's going on with you. you know? I want to hear from this right here in the front. And the back there. Back there, yeah. Raise your hand this time. Both of you. Both of you. <laughs> uh, in 1970, my drag name was Total Assault, or TNA. Total Assault? Total Assault. Total, uh, Jim, Jim Farad, Total Assault, New York City. <laughs> and our cry was gender free. Now things have changed a lot, and Rue, I want to give you the credit that Lance Loud, Loud had in the 70s of telling America who we are and what fun it could be to have fun with each other. And I actually believe that you are more responsible with your team, Randy and Fenton, for making marriage equality happen because young people watched you have fun and be a whole and true person. But my question is, I first saw you as star booty. <laughs> And I don't, and I, I want all the young people to understand who Star Booty was and how Star Booty was transformed into RuPaul. Thank you for that, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, both Randy and Fenton and Tom and I, we come from this, this sort of do-it-yourself concept of the Warhol idea of you if you build it they will come you can create your own your own storyline and not it doesn't have to be that the mainstream sees it doesn't matter if they see it or not if you, you create it yourself so you know with the John Waters mentality the guerrilla filmmaking thing um, I created this uh, character called Star Woody which was like a, a 70s black exploitation um, uh, hero heroine uh, who uh, you know, fought crime. But in doing that, I was able to make a social comment on not only gender, but identity and, and sexuality, everything. And I was just ready, willing to go there. And it really comes from this Warhol concept of show business, that you don't have to be, uh, you know, in Hollywood to create your star. You are already a star. And, you know, and that's how Star Beauty came about. I promise two of those, and it's going to have to be the last two right up here. Aww. <laughs> Hi, my name is Siki. And, and you got that coffee in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
like, if I'm gonna ask a question, my coffee is coming with me. <laughs> what is that? You know, I've been doing the Starbucks uh, app, so I go to the, and it's all ready for me when I get up in there, girl. <laughs> What's what your you name? From Starbucks? You know what? Um, we've been doing this, we've been doing the, um, uh, Fenty uh, latte, but with um, uh, four shots, but with the coconut milk.